At the rate new cruise ships are going, I suppose in a few years, the carnival celebration will be considered small to mid-sized. But for now, the 183,521 gross ton, 1,130 by 137 foot, 6,631 maximum capacity carnival celebration is nothing short of huge. Just slightly larger than her near twin, the 2021 built Mardi Gras, the Carnival Celebration entered service in 2022 and will be joined by the Carnival Jubilee in 2023. Aside from being the largest ships in the Carnival fold, these XL-class behemoths are the most technically advanced and are powered by LNG, liquefied natural gas. To fuel these ships, a special barge was built and home ported in Miami. Because of their size, the Celebration and her sisters are able to offer up all sorts of extra amenities, including Bolt, the world's first seagoing roller coaster, new dining choices, and a three-deck atrium and show venue. Hull number 1397, the Carnival Celebration was built by the Meyer Yard in Turku, Finland, and christened by actress Cassidy Gifford, daughter of Kathy Lee Gifford, former Carnival spokesperson and godmother of the first celebration of 1987. So why not grab a favorite beverage or snack and join me for a detailed top-to-bottom tour of this 15-deck ship, starting at the top with Deck 19. Deck 19 is dedicated to Loft 19, an enclave with plenty of deck chairs, an infinity splash pool, and private cabanas for rent, with chilled towels, lunch delivery, and concierge service. Various fees apply, but general access is complimentary for top Excel level suite occupants. And here's a closer look at one of the cabanas, which can be rented on a daily or full cruise basis. Deck 19 continues aft to the midship beach pool area with the upper level of the ultimate playground, one of six special zones on the carnival celebration. That whooshing sound you hear is the bold roller coaster, usually punctuated with a scream or two. A helpful tip, book your ride early in the cruise just in case it rains, or like me, this will be as close as you get. In addition to Bolt, the loft level of the Ultimate Playground is home to a vertiginous ropes course that even has a zip line over the sea. The Ultimate Playground is also home to Carnival Waterworks, which includes the 312 foot long Blue Lightning, where riders use mats, the aptly named Spiraling Yellow Carnival Twister, and with its rather wicked attendant, the 229 foot Orange Thunder Drop Slide. As a nice bonus from its top platform, there is also a bird's eye view of the ship's whale tail funnel. The forward portion of Deck 18 is dedicated to the adults only Serenity Enclave which on the celebration includes its own sheltered pool area and fresh creations, a salad and snack bar. A few steps farther aft on deck 18, there's a nice view over the midship's beach pool area. Deck 18 continues with the terrestrial level of the ultimate playground. In addition to a sports court, there's cabana style seating and a jogging track. Please reach out to our youth team located at Camp Hodge. 
Just aft of the funnel, there's the waterworks splash area, which features a small dunker and the massive power drencher. At the far aft end, there's a mini golf course and a very nice view over the Deck 16 Tides Pool area. The forward half of Deck 17 is dedicated to staterooms and suites. On midships Deck 17, terraces with deck chairs overlook the busy beach pool area. On the XL class ships, the Red Frog Rum Bar has become the double deck Red Frog Tiki Bar, whose upper level overlooks the pool. Deck 17 continues on the port side with Guy's Burger Joint and the Circle C Youth Center for ages 12 through 14 on the starboard side. Also on the starboard side, the Warehouse Video Arcade is conveniently adjacent to Circle C and the O2 Youth Center, which is on the port side. Open and sheltered seating areas continue aft to another terrace overlooking the Tide's pool area. Deck 16 begins with a fully enclosed state-of-the-art wheelhouse and officers' quarters, as well as more guest accommodations. The midships to aft section of Deck 16 forms the Lido Zone, which includes the midships beach pool, seven dining venues, and the aft tides pool. The beach pool area is fronted with the Blue Iguana Cantina on the port side and a series of exclusive Excel class eateries on the starboard, including the a la carte price seafood shack and the complimentary street eats. Street Eats consists of three venues, which includes Time Fries, Steam Dream, and the excellent Mad Sizzle, which serves up delicious snacks like these curried chicken pancakes. Enclosed seating continues aft from here on the starboard side. Helping fortify the beach pool fun, the lower level of the Red Frog Tiki Bar is on the port side. The casual Lidl Marketplace buffet-style eatery occupies a vast swath of real estate between the beach and tide pools on Deck 16. I've got to admit I didn't expect to be so smitten with Shaq's Big Chicken, but its tasty tender chicken dishes are among my favorite fast food offerings at sea. This not-to-be-missed eatery is on the port side aft, steps away from the tide's pool bar and we'll wrap up our tour of the Lido Zone here at the Tides Pool. Decks 15, 14, 12, and 11, there is no deck 13 in the Carnival Fold, are dedicated to guest staterooms and suites. Deck 10 is also fully dedicated to guest accommodations, but here at least I had access to two categories, an extended balcony stateroom and an interior. My home for a week in the Caribbean 
Extended Balcony Stateroom 10433 was comfortable, thoughtfully laid out, and had a soothing blue and ash-toned color scheme. In addition to a king-size bed, it had plenty of storage space, a writing desk, and a sofa. And every now and then a towel animal would pop in for a quick visit. The modular bathroom was intelligently designed with storage below and above the sink and the shower had a solid door versus a clingy curtain, along with a foot bar to assist those who shaved their legs and a rainforest shower head. But that huge balcony was aching for some full-length loungers to enjoy those unbeatable sea views. And this is a standard inside cabin. Alas, there are no self-service laundry rooms on the celebration, but at least there are ironing rooms. And you guessed it, Deck 9 is dedicated to suites and staterooms. Deck 8 begins with a large block of Havana Club staterooms, which are part of an exclusive enclave with an open promenade that wraps around the bow, a private bar terrace, and an infinity dip pool perched above the sea. Only guests booked in Havana Club staterooms have access to this part of the ship. After the forward vestibule, the rest of Deck 8 is open to all aboard, including the indoor portion of the colorful Havana Bar, which is on the starboard side. In addition to being a popular watering hole, the festive Havana Bar is used for trivia, games, and various get-togethers. Just across from the Havana Bar on the port side, Chebang is an exclusive Excel-class eatery that offers up a tantalizing menu with Chinese and Mexican specialties, this popular alternative restaurant is free of charge, for now anyway, but reservations are required. You knew where I was eating in Shebang? He says you have to get the duck. As you heard the cruise guy, Stuart Sharon, just say, the duck is epic, but then so are the egg noodles, the Kung Pao chicken, green beans, lettuce wraps, egg drop soup, chicken spring rolls, and the coconut cakes and crema catalana desserts. On my first day aboard, I was very honored to have Glenna Prelay, Carnival Cruises New Builds Product Development Director, take me on a tour of the ship. I'll let him explain what comes next on the starboard side of Deck 8, overlooking Celebration Central. So this bar is called Aquaria, and uh, these murals came off of the Carnival Victory. Right? Oh, wow. So these were done by the artist Luciano Vistazzi. Oh, yes, okay. And um, on the Victory, the theme of the ship architecturally was the ocean. Uh, so we had the promenade, and these were lined along the main promenade on Deck 5. Uh, so we, when the ship was converted from Victory to Carnival Radiance, we removed these and also backlit them with these programmable LEDs. A zone unto itself, the three-deck-tall Celebration Central spans decks six through eight on the starboard side of the ship. By day, it offers striking sea views through its towering glass wall that can be covered with LED screens to enhance various functions throughout the day and night, including spectacular shows that incorporate acrobatics, stunning visuals, and high decibel sound and lighting. Bordering Celebration Central on the port side of Deck 8, Banzai Sushi is an a la carte open kitchen eatery that is a popular staple on most carnival ships. Next door at Banzai Teppanyaki, dining is a high energy eardrum splitting showcase of flambés, twirling machetes, and courses that are as entertaining as they are delicious. Oh, no. 
Two More Fun Zones follow Celebration Central on Aft Deck 8. An exterior promenade stretches aft along the starboard side of Deck 8 with open and sheltered seating areas. This also includes the exterior portion of Bar 820, which serves the 820 Biscayne Zone, and farther aft, the watering hole, which serves the summer landing zone. A large hot tub is just steps away from the watering hole. Inside, the passage continues aft on the starboard side via the Pixels Gallery, which leads to 820 Biscayne, a Miami-themed zone named for Carnival Cruise's first address on Biscayne Boulevard. So the zone is 820 Biscayne. It's a celebration of where Carnival was born, uh, our home port. Uh, and uh, so we have Deco Deli, and we have our Miami Slice Pizza. Uh, you'll notice on the ship, in addition to the main Lido, uh, the Lido Marketplace Buffet on Deck 16, we have fast, casual, and gift service food options throughout the ship. Accessed on the port side of 820 Biscayne, Cucina del Capitano is a favorite fleet-wide Italian eatery, but with a new twist, as Glenn Aprile explains. Cucina we have on other ships, yes. it's much smaller, and it's a specialty restaurant, for, but on this ship it's, it's much larger and it's included in the cruise fare. A wall here is dedicated to past and present carnival captains, and another is filled with images of the original MV celebration, which was built in 1987. The decor in here is more modern. It's a, it's a modernized version, so it's a different uh, color scheme. Well, let's do red wine. And now here's a little sampling of some of Cucina's specialties, from mouth-watering appetizers and soups to my favorite dessert. With popular eateries aboard the ships of Princess and Holland America line, executive chef Rudy Sodeman is an ubiquitous presence in the carnival fold. On the XL-class ships, Rudy Sea Grill is accessed on the port side of Deck 8. Like the other ships, the table settings include chargers with Rudy's celebrated food faces. And now for a few selections. This already popular seafood specialty restaurant commands a $38 cover charge and reservations are required. Bridging the 820 Biscayne and summer landing zones on the starboard side of Deck 8, the guest services desk features three striking kinetic Len Genklo artworks that were rescued from the stair tower lobbies of the Carnival Ecstasy. A fun shop selling Carnival gear is off the entrance to Summer Landing, which features the Heroes Tribute Lounge on the starboard side. And here we have the Heroes Tribute Lounge. A display case that if guests want to display something from uh, from one of their, a lot of times it's fam families uh, that, that lost someone, if they want to have a tribute to them, they can put it inside, work with the ship to have it on display. In Heroes, there's a special seating area with a large video screen and memorabilia dedicated to servicemen and women and their families. Just steps away, there's a space with billiards and foosball. Directly across from the Heroes Lounge, Guy's Pig and Anchor Smokehouse Brew House serves up an included in the fair menu of celebrity chef Guy Fieri's barbecue fixings. Inside, there's a stage for live music performances, and on the adjoining lanai on the port side, there's an al fresco counter where guests can enjoy their orders, optimally with the side of warm sea breeze and a dash of sunshine. Farther forward on the port side of Deck 8, you'll find one of my favorite hideaways, a perfect spot to escape the matting crowds. But let's keep that between us so it stays that way. We'll polish off Deck 8 with a look at the patio pool, which is a nice alternative to the busier beach and tides pools up on Deck 16.
taking its name from the towering atriums on the fantasy class ships of the 1990s, the upper level of the two-deck Grand Spectrum showroom begins the lineup of public spaces on Deck 7. If it's showing on your cruise, don't miss the incredible show Amor Latino, but get there early as seating is limited. Another space whose name is a nod to Carnival's heritage, the Empress Casino occupies a large portion of the Deck 7 level of Celebration Central. For those who don't know, Carnival's first two ships, the Mardi Gras and Carnival, were the former Canadian Pacific liners, Empress of Canada and Empress of Britain. And, speak of the devil, elements of both former empresses can be found in the Golden Jubilee on Deck 6. Meanwhile, on the starboard side, Celebration Central begins with the Aquaria Bar and its gorgeous glass panels by Luciano Vistosi that were removed from the Carnival Victories Promenade. And before we move farther aft, here's another swoon-worthy view from the Deck 7 level of Celebration Central. Deck 7 continues aft of Celebration Central with more public spaces and the upper level of another unique fun zone. The Intimate Limelight Lounge follows Celebration Central on the port side of Deck 6 adjacent to a balcony overlooking the Gateway Bar, which we'll delve into with all sorts of behind-the-scenes details shortly. The upper level of the Gateway Zone begins with the Alchemy Bar, a popular go-to for specialty cocktails, leading aft to what is perhaps the ship's most coveted specialty restaurant, Fahrenheit 555. Decked out in rich red tones with silver highlights, Fahrenheit 555 is well worth its $38 cover charge and is one of the finest steakhouses at sea, with sterling service and a wide range of courses that put most other cruise ship steakhouses to shame. Aside from the steaks, which are aged 21 days, there are plenty of seafood and other options, including some of the best desserts at sea. And speaking of desserts, the chocolate sphere is a feat of culinary engineering. With impressive Frank Lloyd Wright inspired dendroform or tree shaped columns in its center, the upper level of the Festival restaurant, one of two main dining rooms, concludes the spaces on Deck 7. Deck 6 is fully dedicated to public rooms, beginning with the lower level of the Grand Spectrum Theatre. The Cloud9 Fitness Center follows on the port side with an array of cardio and weight machines overlooking the sea. On the starboard side, you'll find the entrance to the Cloud9 Spa, which leads down to Deck 5, where the beauty salon, relaxation room, and men's and women's changing areas await. Various treatment rooms offer up numerous massage therapies for a fee, and there's a thermal suite with a hydrotherapy pool and several shower options, as well as a steam and sauna area that includes a unique salt therapy sauna lined in bricks of mineral salts. Back up on Deck 6, the Punchliner Comedy Club follows on the starboard side and across the way is Piano Bar 88. Both are off the main passage, which has an interesting panel that Glenn explains. So this shows the carnival celebration. We have our ship coins, which are used during the, the keel, uh, during the keel lane. And then we have a montage that uh, represents the six zones on board the ship. So oh, wow. you have the Lido zone, Summer Landing, the Ultimate Playground, the Gateway, which is our travel theme zone, and then we have our 820 Biscayne 
Miami theme song. And if you look inside the gateway, you'll see an image of the original celebration. Here we call the zone Celebration Central. On Mardi Gras, it's called Grand Central, but here we wanted to, we call it Celebration Central, named after the ship, but also because when you look in the atrium, you'll see there's nearly 1,400 pieces of confetti. Each one individually controlled, illuminated. We close the windows because they're preparing for the evening entertainment. So here we have another painting, and we used an image of the original celebration, and it looks great as a nice way, uh, one of the first things they'll see when they come on board on embarkation. That's awesome. We've incorporated the Joe Farkas sketch as part of the, co uh, part of the composition. Named for Carnival's 1982 built Tropical, the Tropical Bar is on the starboard side of Celebration Central and features colorful handcrafted mosaics. It also provides much needed seating for the adjacent Java Cafe specialty coffee venue. If you're lucky, maybe you'll encounter my favorite barista, Tootie, here. The Java Cafe also offers up complimentary sweets and savory snacks throughout the day. And for those with an insatiable sweet tooth, next to the Java Cafe is Cherry on Top, Carnival's candy shop. Deck 6 continues with the Gateway Zone, beginning with this 1934 Rolls-Royce recently removed from the now scrapped Carnival Ecstasy, as Glenn explains. The removal of the uh, ah, of right. from the Ecstasy. We had, it, we, we had it brought to a shop in Turku, uh, or near Turku, Finland, and touched it up a little bit, and then there, there, there she is on the, when she arrived in Turku, getting ready to be loaded on board. Wow. Spirit of Ecstasy uh, hood ornament, right? Fittingly, the spirit of ecstasy is parked outside of my favorite space on any active ship, the Golden Jubilee, although I'm admittedly biased. Celebrating Carnival's 50th anniversary, the Golden Jubilee is filled with artifacts and displays, including historic items like the Chadburn Bridge Wing Telegraph from the former Carnival and a wall of glass from the former Mardi Gras that I rescued from the Indian scrapyards. Working closely with the Carnival team, Glenn envisioned this space, which also includes a timeline of dioramas depicting Carnival's history through the decades. We start with the 70s and we go all the way forward to present day. Everything in this corridor points forward, right? Uh, so we have the telegraph here. So when you put it into the all ahead full position, it points forward. We have our ship model that points forward. We have coins. All of the ships are pointing forward, and, uh, and we start with the original ships uh, on the aft end, and as you walk forward, the, the you'll get to the newer zone. So this explains at a high level what each gallery is about. And if you really want to see more detail, you can scan this QR code once you're connected to the to the ship's Wi-Fi network. You don't need an internet package to see it. You just need to be on the Wi-Fi network, scan this, and it'll pull up a document that will take you through uh, these, these spaces and, and a story behind each, each diorama in much more detail. The first ship that comes in is the uh, Empress of Canada, and you'll see it transform from a black and white image of the Empress of Canada in the, in the original livery. Oh wow! Uh, and then go and then go to the to the carnival. Oh, how cool! Yeah. Our 1980s diorama here is inspired by the Bourbon Street on board the original celebration. Uh, so we label it archi entertainment architecture because to me the holiday class really represents the birth of, uh, of, of entertainment architecture. For example, the Bourbon Street on the celebration had a streetcar. Yep. So, and there was a sign on it that said Bourbon Street with the numbers 953. Uh, there was a trolley bar nearby and this is so this is it, it draws inspiration from that scene on board into the 90s and with the introduction of the fantasy class came these elevating uh, atriums that we call the gap that, that were called the grand spectrum in the 2000s we introduced the spirit class and one of the uh, one of the interesting design features of the in, of the spirit class is that we had the atrium skylight and the supper club was part of the uh, funnel casing with these red lit uh, red tinted glass uh, sk uh, skylight. So we have the lighting here that it shines on the outside that you see the funnel and then it changes to, the, to light shining from inside so that you can see guests having fun in what was the supper club and now today the steakhouse on our, on our sphere. 2010 decade uh, we've, and we started rolling out um, 
on new builds and also existing ships, these branded experiences, where we really went from focusing not just on designing the space architecturally, but designing the entire experience holistically from not only what the space looks like, but working with the bar team to design the menu, the uniforms, the, uh, the visual identity, the branding that carries through to the uniforms and the tap handles. And, uh, and, and, and the Red Frog Pub was one of the first branded experiences that we developed, and it's one of many, like Alchemy, the Guy's Burger Joint, Blue Iguana Cantina, uh, that we started to roll out throughout the fleet. So uh, while we don't have a Red Frog Pub, on this particular ship, we do have a brewery that's part of the Pig and Anchor uh, Smokehouse Brew House in Summer Landing, and we have a brand extension of the Red Frog uh, Pub up on our on our pool deck, which is the Red Frog Tiki Bar. So uh, today, you have a representation of guests looking up at the Seaside Theater, and this is going to be an evolving display uh, that that will give you a sense of what's to come in terms of our fun ships, new ships that we're introducing over. Uh, in the near future, or Carnival Luminoso, which uh, started sailing with guests on the same day that uh, Carnival Celebration sailed on its main door. I especially love this etched glass transom above the forward doors to the bar area from the former Carnival, featuring that ship's original namesake, the three-funneled Empress of Britain of 1931. Another part of that beautiful ship is backlit and mounted nearby. This is part of the etched glass wall from the ballroom of the 1956 built Empress of Britain, later Carnival, Carnival's second ship. When you look through the little opening, you see Carnival's original, original uh, logo, or let's say early, yeah. early logo, let's say, of our Carnival widget. And then when you open, it reveals a stylized funnel and it tells you a story of the Golden Jubilee. And then you have cocktails highlights through the decades of popular cocktails, each one with a story. And then in here, we've also included some of Joe Farkas's architectural drawings, oh, cool. which you also see on display in our blueprint mural that goes all the way around the bar. Right. And like I mentioned in the back, there's a QR code here. You can scan it and it'll tell you the story and the detail of all of the items that we have. Here's the Golden Jubilee Bar during a quiet moment with its upper level windows looking into the Empress Casino and the architectural blueprints from past carnival ships lining the upper perimeter, including former carnival architect Joe Farkas's drawings of the trolley bar on the original celebration. More historic carnival Easter eggs waiting to be discovered include etched glass panels inspired by those from the carnival's purser's lobby in the base of the bar and inlaid nickel maple leaves in the tile work inspired by those in Mardi Gras, the former Empress of Canada's ballroom banisters. I'd like to give a shout out here to the Golden Jubilee's pianist, Oscar Alejandro, for letting me use his virtuoso music for this video. Here, if you, if you scan the QR code, right, and you pull it, right, and it gives you the Golden Jubilee. Yeah. And, it, and here's a little guide to tell you where everything is. That's great. And then if you go to the very end, you'll find a familiar face. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We have the tables, original from Fascination. So when Fascination retired, we removed these yep. uh, and reconditioned them, and they all have the Al Hirschfeld uh, sketches. Fantastic. So uh, in addition to admiring the artwork, guests can sit here and look for the Nina, because Al Hirschfeld always hid a Nina oh, right. in, yeah. in every single one of his drawings. Oh. The number after Hirschfeld's signature indicated how many Ninas, his daughter's name, were hidden in each work. For almost 20 years, since this glass wall was removed from the former Mardi Gras at the scrapyard in Alang, India, its components moved around from various exhibits and galleries in California to my garage and back. I'm so happy to see it finally back at sea in such a perfect setting. Each of these components were hand etched and represent Canadian flora since the Mardi Gras Carnival's first ship was originally the Canadian Pacific Ocean Liner, Empress of Canada. Glenn has
have the chairs in the room replicated from the Carnival's Riverboat Club Casino. The originals were Italian Albania chairs designed by Gustavo Pulitzer Finale in 1964. And then yeah. we have our builder's plate from the celebration, which is from your collection as well. Okay. So the mirrors, I don't know when Joe, Joe originally did a, a series of beautiful sketches of our ship. We had them in the hallways and cabin corridors on a number of ships. I know we had them on a Destiny, we had them on the Ecstasy, uh, and, and maybe some others. I actually had them on paper. So, uh, so we used that to have them scanned and then reproduced and incorporated into the mirrors here. You can find more videos about the Golden Jubilee and past and present carnival ships on the Carnival playlist on this channel. Just after the Golden Jubilee, the Carnival restaurant features a nice model of its namesake ship removed from the recently scrapped inspiration. The Carnival is one of two main dining rooms on the Carnival Celebration. And now Glenn will give us some background on the rest of the zone that encompasses the Golden Jubilee. On Mardi Gras, this zone is called the French Quarter, and on this ship, it's called the Gateway. So it's a travel-inspired zone, celebrating all things travel, the social nature of travel. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of symbolic of, if you think of Carnival, we're celebrating 50 years, and over the last 50 years, <laughs> But by virtue of, uh, of cruising, you have people from all walks of life coming together on a ship, getting to meet, each, meet people from all over the world, all around the country, interacting with our team members that come from all over the world. And at the same time, while you're having this amazing, fun social experience, you're being transported to new destinations. Architecturally, it's inspired by uh, grand terminals, train stations, uh, ocean terminals, uh, you see, we have the bar here, Latitudes, where we have a mechanical split flap board, which is reminiscent of the departure boards you'd see in old terminals. Uh, we also have um, these 12 virtual windows above, which right now is just showing kind of plain sky and, and occasional surprises. But every night here in the gateway, uh, we're going to go to a different destination, a different journey. There'll be items at the bar that are highlighted from our menu of drinks all around the world that'll be featured on those evenings. We'll have food specials at Emerald's Bistro 1397 that are that follow along with the evening that, uh, evening journey. And tonight, the, we don't go to a particular country, but the, 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 the evening journey is called Embark on a Journey. It's kind of symbolic of the uh, of the excitement that comes, the anticipation that comes when you're beginning a new a new trip, a new adventure somewhere, and you'll see screens showing different modes of travel. We will run a, a it's called a Golden Jubilee. It's a basically a historic segment that shows all of the carnival ships in the fleet. It'll show uh, it'll show highlights of the godmothers that we've had through the years. Uh, and, and, and basically uh, allude to the Golden Jubilee and just the role that that has played in, in, in travel itself. So if you're, uh, if you're familiar with, the, with all of our carnival ships, uh, it'll be a really moving and fun, fun display. There's so many things to discover. I mean, if you look at the passport stamps on the back of these, uh, uh, the back of our bar stools, you'll find a stamp that says Turku, Finland, and the date. And the date shows the delivery date of the oh. ship from the shipyard. This is story-driven design. Yeah. And it's not just designing architecturally the space, but designing the experience. Everything ties back to the overarching story. Also, at the end of the, of the, of the promenade, we have uh, our gateway atlas. So it's an interactive digital map where you can go and see uh, the locations of all of the carnival ships in the fleet, where they are, and you can tap on them and see where they are and where they're going. And the name of the restaurant is Emerald's Bistro 1397. 1397 is the whole number. The core menu is very similar to Mardi Gras, which is a New Orleans inspired menu. But then we have a rotating menu that'll change every evening. The difference is the configuration. Because on Mardi Gras, the show kitchen is outboard. So all, all those windows on the lower level would be blocked by the, uh, or not all of them, most of the windows are blocked by the show kitchen for emeralds. And then there's some seating around the show kitchen because the show kitchen is kind of tucked under, under that recess. And then there's some seating across the way. I hope you don't mind my slipping in some favorite emeralds selections before we continue aft on deck six. Next up is the Carnival Kitchen, where guests can sign up for cooking classes. And just a bit farther aft on the starboard side, there's a small conference room overlooking the sea. 
And at the far aft end of deck six, we find the lower level of the Festival restaurant main dining room. Named for Carnival's third ship, it shares an identical menu with the single level Carnival restaurant. The included in the fair food here is consistently good to excellent with a wide range of international courses, including a fantastic Indian vegetarian entree. And let's just say the dining experience in this main dining room lives up to the name Festival. Aside from the Cloud9 Spa, which we saw earlier, and the chef's table dining area in the galley, Deck 5 is devoted to accommodations. On Deck 4, there are more accommodations, including the family-friendly Family Harbor staterooms, which have their own lounge, Camp Ocean, which has activities for guests under 12 years old, and Dr. Seuss's Bookville. On deck three, there's a boarding area, and from here, we'll go even deeper into the ship, starting with the engine control room. Many thanks to Richard Pruitt for the tour of Carnival Celebrations Recycling and Waste Treatment Facilities, as well as her engine room and its powerful diesels that drive her twin azimuth pods at a cruising speed of up to 23 knots. And speaking of tours, this deck ends here. Hope you enjoyed, and if so, please do the like and subscribe thing. Thank you.